In the last episode, we talked more than a little bit about the heady philosophical nature of words and images, so this week I thought I might, well, bring it back down to the ground. Perhaps one of the most frequently overlooked roles in comics has to be the letterer. Don't believe me? When was the last time you heard someone talking about Todd Klein, Artie Simek, John Workman, Janice Chang, or Tom Wurzakowski? Maybe you haven't even heard of them. Don't worry. It's never too late to right or wrong, and anyway, I'll wager you're not alone. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. Considering the fact that we say we read comics, it's actually kind of weird that we pay so little attention to the person who actually puts the words on the page. I think part of the issue is a lot of people assume that the penciler or the inker is the person who does it, and this is occasionally true. But more often than not, and especially in the so-called mainstream titles from big publishers, the letterer is a specialist job. As we talked about in the last episode, the look of written words is a big deal with a lot of implications. And throughout the years, certain conventions, codes, and traditions have developed regarding how words work and look in comics. There's a reason we know, for example, that Comic Sans doesn't actually look, well, like a comic book. So there are two factors that affect the development of comic book text more than anything. Readability and reproducibility. Take a look at this 1808 print by George Cruikshank. That's some pretty cool handwriting, but can you imagine if this full-size engraving was shrunk down? Pretty hard to read. It's actually a little tough as it is. So as comics make their way from full-size prints into newspapers, creators had to start to think about the technological and material limits of their medium. So let me tell you a little bit about letter forms. Not everyone gets as excited about them as me, but I promise it will be relevant. So, strap in. We all know about cases. Uppercase and lowercase. Easy breezy. Here's where things get a little more complicated. The line that touches the bottom of the majority of letters, including all capitals, is called the baseline. The next major measurement for letter forms is called the X height, which is the height of the majority of lowercase letters. And it's called the X height specifically because, well, it's the height of the lowercase X. I've also seen it called the mean line, which would refer to it being the midline of the font. Then finally, there's cap height, which is the height of the top of the uppercase letter. So the parts of lowercase letters that go down below the baseline are called the descenders. And the bits that go above the X height are called Ascenders. Something that you might have picked up if you've played around with any kind of processor or any kind of design program is the concept of a serif. Now a serif is a little flourish, flourish here at the end tail of a letter. It kind of mimics the tails and connections between letters in cursive handwriting, and because of this it creates a flow from letter to letter. So from what I understand, serif typefaces are considered easier to read in print because of this connection. However, on screens, the serifs are often lost if the screen definition of an image quality isn't high enough, and therefore sans serif fonts are recommended for screen reading. Sans, as we say in, in my Midwestern accent, or sans, is French for without. So sans serif fonts, like this one, simply mean without serif. One final thing that I'll mention here, and that's kerning. So spacing can refer to spaces between words or between lines, but kerning refers specifically to the spaces between letters. Now this might seem straightforward, but with letters like W, Y, V, sometimes even M, they have diagonal lines. So if a letterer isn't careful about the spacing between these letters, words can seem disconnected. That was fun. Okay, so what does this have to do with comics? Well. The familiar comic style lettering comes from meeting several needs about readability, reproducibility, and, well, cost effectiveness, too. See, newspapers and early comic books are printed on newsprint, which is a cheap form of paper that bleeds really easily. Fine, fiddly lettering tends not to hold up to reproduction very well, and it would end up looking splotchy. Details get lost really easily. I think this is also the reason the standard cartoony style of drawing becomes a standard for visual representation. That's another episode. Because of the issues with ink bleeding and cheap paper, one thing that disappears from comics lettering almost immediately are lowercase letters. Using only uppercase letters gives another added benefit. You don't have to worry about ascenders and especially descenders affecting the distance between lines. 
If you've ever been writing something and had a Y on one line or a G and it has to butt up against an H or a T on the line below it, it's no bueno. Uppercase Ys and Ts don't have that problem. Another thing that has to go if you're dealing with bleed, cheap paper, and reproducibility, well, serifs. Of course, most early comics were hand-lettered, so it's not as though everyone was making carefully serifed letters, but artists simplified nonetheless. From the full-on cursive Crookshank engraving from 1808 I showed earlier, to this full-page Sunday strip of Occult's Yellow Kid from 1897, the writing is simplified and clearer. It's still a bit all over the place, though, and shows some signs of flair, and dare I say, some little serifs in here and there. Now, if you look at this 1904 Dream of Verbit Fiend by Windsor McKay, the lettering is way more simplified. And simplified is not something folks usually say about Windsor McKay's work. By the time we get to 1938's Action Comics number one, we see an even more simplified lettering, with a better sense of spacing in the word balloons to boot. Spacing in word balloons is one of the biggest issues a letterer has to deal with outside of readability of the individual letters. If the letters get too close to the edges, called gridlock in the industry, this makes the balloon feel crowded, and crowded things are just harder to read. On the other hand, if there's too many parking spaces, which are empty spots at the end of lines, or too much air, empty space around the words, the balloon could feel underutilized, or the lettering could create an emotional effect that the letterer might not have intended. Of course, I could do a whole extra spiel about the shapes and borders of word balloons, but only so much time. So, the comic-y style font that we recognize, which is actually an amalgamation of the handwriting of hundreds, if not thousands, of letterers over the years, comes from a response to making readable letters that could be easily reproduced using the cheap materials of the time. While there are a lot of individual ticks you can pick out, most of these letterers shared similarities. All caps, no serifs, a slightly italic slant. Letterers learned to stop using crossbars on I's except when using pronouns because it was harder to read and used up valuable space. They created conventions for ellipses and hyphenations. It's sort of like food. So every Italian chef has their own spin on food and their own unique recipes. But you know when you're eating Italian food because of the shared ingredients and similar philosophies about food. So that's how we know what a comics font looks like, even though we're not actually looking at a single specific comics font or typeface, but the masterful handwriting of thousands of talented artists. To me, that's just really cool. Of course, there's some alternative methods too. For example, one notable exception is EC Comics, sort of mechanical looking typeface that was the product of what's called a Leroy lettering guide, a machine first used in drafting. It's still done by hand, actually, but it's using a template and a guide. It's a really readable typeface, but somehow kind of lifeless. Today, a majority of letters work with computers and computer-generated typefaces. But don't let that fool you into thinking that the craft is gone from the work. First, there's the issue of choice. A lot of these letters have custom-designed typefaces made from their own handwriting. And even if they don't do that, there's Comicraft, one of the many providers of comic book typefaces. Well, they have over 90 choices just for basic word balloon fonts. Then, letterers still have to consider spacing, placement, emphasis, and more. And all of that so you can actually read the text the writer put in a document. So it's a pretty important job. Not to mention sound effects. Did I mention that letterers are usually the ones who do sound effects? <laughs> Huh. Maybe that's for another episode. See you next time. Huh. Hey, baby girl. <laughs>